lawsmarketplace.com, the site where the tribes unite. Check out fresh Israelite apparel for both men and women with new items added frequently. Don't forget to join the marketplace so you can promote your own products and services. Kwam Yasha Ali. Shalom family, the soul food topic on tonight is get your mind right and this will be part three. Uh, we have to learn as believers to rid ourselves of unfruitful thoughts, unrighteous thoughts, um, ungodly thoughts and begin to meditate on that which is righteous, meditate on that which is good, that we might please the most high God. So I'll have you Gail go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and read verses 3 through 6. We read this last time but I just want to go over it couple scriptures that we read last time just to uh, uh, refresh ourselves. So 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 3 through 6. And again, the title is Get Your Mind Right. We have to get our mind right. Whatever thing that we're dealing with in the flesh, whatever temptation, Whatever it is that we're going through, we have to learn to get our mind right in order to do the will of God. So 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 6. Go ahead. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Uh -huh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through Yahweh to the pulling down of strongholds. Salakia, so when we're warring against our flesh, we do not use carnal means to fight this war. We don't use guns or knives or, you know, uh, carnal ammunition, but you have to use spiritual ammunition, spiritual warfare to fight against the flesh. Read on. Casting down, imi casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of Yahweh. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of, of Mashiach. Salakia. So the scripture here, Paul is letting us know what spiritual tactics and methods we must use in this life, in this walk, in order to get our mind right. You have to bring into subjection and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Mashiach. So if you're having a thought, if you're having an inclination, an urge, a fantasy... That is contrary to the will of God in the scripture. You have to bring those things into subjection. Bring those things into captivity. Cast them down. Okay? You have to get a reign. You have to get power and dominion over those thoughts. Because if not, they'll begin to reign, uh, reign over you. Read on. Verse 6. And having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience. When your obedience is fulfilled. Okay. From there, let's go to 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. And read that for me as well. John, can you do me a favor? Can you mute your line until you're able to start talking? Because it was a lot of noise just then. Okay, um, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. So the writer is saying that every uh, evil thing that we're going to be tempted with or challenged with in this life will either fall into one of these three categories. Either it'll be the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, or the pride of life. So in order to get your mind right, you have to have dominion, control, and mastery of all three components, okay, of the flesh. You have to deal with all three of these areas and master it in order to truly have your mind right to please God. So last time we went over the lust of the eye and the lust of the flesh. Now we're going to deal with the pride of life in part three here. So beginning with that, we're going to go to the book of Sirach. Chapter 10 and read verses 6, 7, and 12, and 13. I'll go ahead and read that. So we're going to the book of Sirach, chapter 10, verses 6 and 7, 12, and 13. We're dealing with the pride of life. So 
the lust of the eye has more to do with covetousness, desiring, you know, uh, the material things in this life. The lust of the flesh is dealing with sexual lust, okay, dealing with uh, wantonness in the flesh, dealing with, you know, lewdness and things of that nature, being sexually attracted to someone, things of that nature. And now pride of life, these are the things that separate us from, from, from God. When we begin to transgress and be rebellious, hating our brother, things of that nature. And we're going to get into that tonight. So Sirach chapter 10, verses 6 and 7, 12 and 13. And it reads, Bear not hatred to thy neighbor for every wrong, and do nothing at all by injurious practices. 7. Pride is hateful before God and man, and by both doth one commit iniquity. Okay? So, again, we're dealing with the, the pride of life. So, verse 7 says that pride is hateful before God and man. So, when one walks in haughtiness and pride, that's something that God and man hates all alike. Where you can witness someone who's haughty and full of themselves and con with conceit and, 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 pro and proud. Man, I, this dude, I can't stand dealing with this dude. Because they're so haughty, they're so full of themselves, they walk in such pride. Not, not a pride where you have, um, you know, you take, you know, uh, take care of the things that you do. And, you know, you have a certain, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, you know, there's a difference between having pride in yourself for the things that you've accomplished and the things that you've done and then being proud okay being haughty not wanting to hearken unto instruction and listen to guidance there's a total difference and when someone is proud that means that they're rebellious that means that they do not listen that means that they are vain full of themselves and self-willed okay so six again Bear not hatred to thy neighbor for any wrong and do nothing at all by injurious practices. Pride is hateful before God and man and by both doth one commit iniquity. 12 and 13. The beginning of pride is when one departeth from God and his heart is turned away from his maker. So when pride comes into someone's heart, it's when they turn away from God, when they turn away from the commandments. So in 1 John it says, all that is in the world is the lust of the eye, the, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, okay? When the pride of life begins to take its root in you, it's when you begin to not keep the commandments of God. When you turn away and you begin to do that which is pleasing to your own self, that's when pride gets into your spirit, gets into your mind, okay? And when you are filled with pride, like the scripture says, it is hateful before God. You can't please God being prideful. That's something you got to deal with. That's something you have to eradicate from your spirit, man. Pride is a very dangerous thing. Verse 13, for pride is the beginning of sin, and he that hath it shall pour out abomination. So when you have pride dwelling on the inside of you, it is a matter of time before you sin and do something that is greatly abominable before the Most High God. Because when you're prideful, you don't listen. You're rebellious. You are self-willed. Okay? You have your own view and conviction of things around you. You do not want to hearken to sound counsel. You do not want to be corrected. The prideful will not hearken to correction. But will go in the way of sin and iniquity. For pride is the beginning of sin. And he that hath it shall pour out abomination. And therefore Yahweh brought upon them strange calamities and overthrew them utterly. Speaking of our great ancestors in the wilderness. Okay? When they were prideful and rebelled against God and hearkened not to his commandments and kept not the covenant, but rather murmured and complained. And when straightway commandments were given unto them, they didn't listen. They didn't listen. They said unto themselves, let us make ourselves captains and go back into Egypt. I don't want to do what the Most High God is asking us to do. I want to do something that's a prideful heart. And that is very evil. 
It's like you're very hateful. And it is the beginning of sin. When you are walking in the way of sin, you are walking in pride because you do not want to obey the voice of God. Okay. From there, let us go to Proverbs chapter 8, verses 13. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13. Yeah, I have to read that. Sorry. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13. Okay. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13. The fear of Yahweh is to hate evil, pride and arrogancy, and the evil way. And the froward mouth do I hate. Read it one more time, please. The fear of Yahweh is to hate evil. Salaki, so hold it right there. So we just read in Sirach where it says that pride is the beginning of sin. Okay? Pride is the beginning of sin. So pride will guide someone to stop the ears and say, I don't want to listen. I'm going to do my own thing. Okay, if you have an, an older individual trying to mentor a younger person and say, hey, I think you ought to do it this way. Or I think you should do it that way. I've had a lot of experience in this area of, of I have expertise in this area. The pride of a youth will say, uh, OK, but I, I, I think I'm going to do it this way. But experience says to do it this way. No, but I'm going to do it this way. That's pridefulness. And that will lead to sin. That will lead to error. But. In order to avoid error, in order to avoid sin, read the, the, the top of the verse again. The fear of Yahweh is to hate evil. Okay, so the fear of Yahweh is, is really the antithesis, the opposite of pride. Because pride stops the ear and says, no, I'm not listening. I'm not listening. I'm going to be rebellious. I'm going to do my own thing. But the fear of Yahweh is literally hearkening, bowing down, humbling yourself and saying, Heavenly Father, what is it you want me to do? It's the complete opposite. Pride is I'm going to do my own thing. I'm not listening. The fear of Yahweh is I am prepared to listen and obey. And if you walk in the fear of Yahweh, you will. What does it say? Um, the fear of Yahweh is to hate evil. Is to hate evil. Read on. To hate evil, pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the forward mouth do I hate. So when you walk in the fear of Yahweh, pridefulness is put away instantly. If you are sincerely walking in the spirit of the fear of the Most High God, pridefulness, arrogancy, all those different things that are a stumbling block to us when we become carnal and our mind are perverted through unrighteousness. When you start to fear God and keep his commandments and fear him. So that these things aren't taken uh, lightly. Oh, I break the commandments. Oh, it's okay. I just ask for forgiveness and do it. No, but you fear God so that when you fall, okay, you are beseeching the Most High for forgiveness and mercy because you fear him. You do not want to mess up. You don't make light of his commandments. So pridefulness and all these things are done away with when you're sincerely walking in uprightness and you hate evil. You hate evil. OK. From there, I'm going to go to Wisdom of Solomon, chapter five, verses eight and nine. Again, we're dealing with the pride of life, the pride of life. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter five, verses eight and nine. What hath pride profited us? Or what good hath riches with our vaunting brought us? Verse 9. All those things are passed away like a shadow, and as a post that haste by. Okay? So what hath pride profited us? What good thing can there be found in pridefulness? All that is left when pride is all used up is death. We read uh, in, in part one, we read Romans, I believe it's Romans 8, yeah, Romans 8, that to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. To be prideful is hateful. It's the beginning of sin. It's what's leadeth unto, unto destruction. So if you practice pridefulness, what will it profit you? 
but that. That's all you have to look forward to when you walk in pride. Pride will lead to destruction. That's why it's so imperative that we get our mind right and rid ourselves of the evil of pridefulness. And the best way to do that is to walk in the fear of Yahweh and hate all manner of evil. So by doing that, you rid yourself of arrogancy. You rid yourself of vanity. You rid yourself of pridefulness. You rid yourself of every ill spiritually that will lead you in, a, in the ways of sin. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. It pride is the beginning of sin. So it will lead to destruction. Okay? Jonathan, if you have your Bible, I have you go to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 15 and verse 9. Okay? That's Deuteron Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 9. Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 9. Go ahead and read when you get it. Thank you. No, that's it. That's it. There's nine. So when I read Sirach 10, matter of fact, I'm going to go back there real quick. 10 and 6. Um, 10 and 6, it said, Bear not hatred to thy neighbor for every wrong, and do nothing at all by injurious practices. So when your neighbor does something to you that offends you, do not seek to exact that offense through hatred okay or get back at him okay that is because from there it goes into pride is hateful so when you do that that shows that you hate your brother that shows that you have a lack of compassion within you that's prideful to the most high god it's prideful to god and it's prideful to man okay so now what we're reading in deuteronomy is talking about that spirit, because all the other three, the other two components of the flesh that we read in First John 2, the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, that's that's dealing with other areas of our of our carnal life. OK, but the pride of life is dealing with that aspect which separates us from God, whether us disobeying God directly and things that he has told us to do or in the hatred of our brother, the, the, the children of our people. OK. Walking in pridefulness, walking in, in hatred of our brothers. So Deuteronomy 15 and 9 is saying, Beware that there be not a thought in thy wicked heart. What kind of thought would that be? A prideful thought. A rebellious, vain, arrogant thought in your mind. Because again, the topic is get your mind right. So the law of Moses is saying to us here in Deuteronomy, check yourself. We read in, in the scripture where we were talking about the lust of the eye, where Yahweh Shai said unto the disciple, beware of covetousness. Now Moses is saying, beware of pridefulness. Let not, beware that there be not a thought in your wicked heart saying, the seventh year, the year of release is at hand, and thine eye be evil against thy poor brother. Meaning, your brother's in need. He's asked of your help. He's asked of your aid. Okay. You know that the seventh year, the year of, of release is, a, is, 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 um, is at hand. And you're thinking to yourself, man, if I do this, I'm not going to be able to get what I want. Okay. I'm not going to be able to get what I'm, what I'm looking to get in return. So I'm not going to give this to him. I'm going to refuse to give what I should give him. He's poor. He's in need. He's my brother. I should be in a position. I am in a position to help him and I should just help him. But because I'm thinking of how I can circumvent 
the laws of God so that I come out on the winning end, I'm not going to give him anything. Okay? Beware that. Beware that there be not a thought in thy wicked heart, saying, The seventh year, the year of release is at hand, and thine eye be evil against thy poor brother, and thou givest him naught, and he cry unto Yahweh against thee, and it be sin unto thee. So because the pridefulness is in your heart, the pride of life has overrun you. Okay, that hateful pride, because it says pride is hateful before God and man. So when that poor brother sees your pridefulness in full display, he cries into the Most High and say, deal with him. I was poor and I was in need and I know he got it. And he did me dirty. Pride is hateful. Pride is the beginning of sin. What did Cain do to Abel way, way back? It was pridefulness. OK, because Cain saw that his that Cain saw that his brother's Abel's offering was accepted of God, but his was not. But the Most High gave Cain place to repent, but he did not. He said, why is your countenance fallen? Get yourself together and give me a better sacrifice and I'll be pleased with you as well. But if you're going to give me sloppy seconds then I'm not going to be pleased and I'm not going to accept your sacrifice. <clears throat> but that wasn't good enough for Cain. He sought a pretense to slay his brother Abel because his, ex his sacrifice was accepted. His offering was pleasant in the sight of God. And it came through the process of time that Cain sought a pretense and slayed his brother through pride. The Most High God said to Cain that sin croucheth. Let's go there and find it. Bear with me. Let's go to Genesis. Genesis 22. 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 Genesis Thou not be accepted, and if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. Remember, pride is the beginning of sin. So the Heavenly Father saw that Cain was walking in the way of pride. And he says that sin is lying, lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. So if you don't deal with this, sin will be your companion. And you will be the master of pride. Verse 8. And Cain talked with Abel his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field. That Cain, so like he rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. So what caused Abel to do that? Yeah, it was hatred. But it was pridefulness first. It was pridefulness. It was the pride of life. Instead of Cain correcting himself. Getting his mind right and realizing. Yeah, God, you right. You're right. I gave you sloppy seconds. Let me come correct next time. Let me learn something from my brother Abel. Abel, what should I do, you know, so that my, you know, my offering be accepted? Well, you should do this and do that. This is what I did. And, you know, maybe you'll get accepted next time. He didn't do that. Like, man, that nigga Abel. He always got to show me up. It was pridefulness that Cain did not repent and correct himself. And he slew his brother, the pride of life. Okay? And so we're being taught in Deuteronomy 15 to beware of that same pridefulness that Cain had. Yeah, you may not look to slay your brother physically, but spiritually you're seeking to do his, him harm because you're only thinking of yourself. Don't let a wicked thought rise up in your mind and say, yo, the seven years is coming up. I'm really not trying to part with this. Man, he'll be all right. And your poor brother crying to the Most High, and the Most High repay you for your evil deed. Okay? From there, let's go to Matthew chapter 7, verses 3 through 5. Gail, I have you read that. Matthew chapter 7, verses 3 through 5.
Okay, Matthew chapter 7, verses 3 through 5. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considereth not the beam that is in thine own eye? So, like, yeah. so why are you being a hypocrite? Why are you being a hypocrite? You're beholding the mote in your brother's eye, but you ain't dealing with that beam in your own eye. Read. Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. So again, pridefulness, arrogancy, the only way to avoid these things is through the fear of Yahweh and the hating of all evil. Okay? So you can't help anybody else. You can't guide your brother in righteousness if you yourself have not dealt with these things. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. You must deal with these things first and foremost in order to be in any position to help your brother. You can't guide him in righteousness if you yourself haven't dealt with these matters. You got to get your mind right. Walk upright. Keep the commandments. Fear him. Read. Verse 5, thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. So first, deal with your own problems. Deal with your own problems. Okay? Going back to Cain and Abel. Cain had an opportunity to deal with his own issues, but he sought to put blame on his brother. Put blame on his brother as though what Abel did was an offense unto Cain. It wasn't an offense unto you. But you did not take the opportunity to correct yourself. You are a hypocrite, prideful, hateful. We must deal with these things. The pride of life. Not wanting to listen. The fear of Yahweh is humbling down and saying, I obey thee. What is it that thou requires of me, O God? I shall hear you and obey. That's what the fear of Yahweh is. Pride is stopping the ear and saying, no, nah, I'm not listening. I'm not listening. You're a hypocrite. Everything that comes out of your mouth is, is, is hypocrisy. Because you say one thing, but you're doing another. You're trying to help your brother. I'll say, yo, bro, let me get that mote out your eye. When you got a huge beam in your own eye. You are a hypocrite. From there, yeah, I'll stay there in Matthew. But I'm going to go to Ephesians chapter 5, read verses 8 through 11. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 through 11. It reads, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in Yahweh. Walk as children of light. 9. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Okay? So when you begin to bear fruit is when you begin to walk in the commandments of God. Doing that which pleases Him. Okay? Walking in light and not in darkness. If you're walking in darkness, you can't bring forth fruit. Even on a physical level. If you hide um, fruit that is near unto ripeness in the dark, it won't ripen. It'll spoil, okay? You have to take the fruit out from darkness and put it in the light so that it might receive the nutrients from the sun and ripen. So think about that spiritually. If you're in darkness spiritually, you will not bear fruit. You will be bearing in darkness. And it won't matter because nobody can see what you're bearing or not bearing. <laughs> but if you are in the light, you shall bear fruit, okay? For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. 10. Proving what is acceptable unto Yahweh. Verse 11. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Because pride tells you, stop the ear. I don't want to hear. I don't want to hearken. Like Cain, I will not correct myself. I was given uh, ample opportunity to repent and change my ways, to amend my ways before God. He stopped and said, why is your countenance fallen? Why are you wroth? If you do right, won't you be accepted? Yeah. Then do right. 
because sin lieth at the door and his desire is for you. So you better get yourself together, Cain. You had he had the opportunity, but he he chose rather to slut to slay his brother. The pride of life is the beginning of sin. So we must come out of darkness, get our mind right, walk in the fear of Yahweh, proving, verse 10, proving what is acceptable unto Yahweh. How do you prove that? By reading the scriptures, okay? By reading the scriptures and understanding what God desires of us, what is required of us. Verse 11, and having no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. What does that mean? Going back to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through Yah to the pulling down of stronghold, casting down imagination, every thought, every high thing, bringing it down, bringing it into captivity. That's how you reprove these things. You have to deal with them. Every thought that is against God, you got to deal with it in your mind. Cast it out of your mind. Okay? You can't allow these things to roam in your mind for they will lead to sin. They will lead to your downfall. You have to deal with these things. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. So when we're talking about the weapons of our warfare, not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of stronghold, spiritual warfare, spiritual taxes. How do we deal with these things? Whether it be the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, or the pride of life, how do we use practical application to begin to rid ourselves of these evil thoughts and get our mind right? You have to remove yourself from people who do these things. Verse 11, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. So if you know there are people in your social circle who are full of darkness, you need to remove yourself from them because you don't want to be in darkness. You want to be in light that you might bear righteous fruit. If you got friends and family and people in your social circle who all they do is uh, produce weeds and, and, and vines and they're, they're in darkness, those are, the, those are not the type of people you want to be around. Those are not the type of people you want to invest time in. Vines are wrong. Huh? Vines are bad. I mean, just vines in the sense you're not producing fruit. That's what I mean. Weeds. Like the weeds and vines at my job where the vines come out and they take over the entire bush and then they like they choke out the bushes essentially because when you go to try to yank and pull those insidious vines up the bush is like dry it's in it like when you pull it up it pulls the leaves off the bushes too so the bush is diminished so think about that spiritually if these people are in darkness and you're in, you're have company with them and you're a bush trying to produce fruit, trying to blossom and grow, and you're around these weeds and vines, they will take hold on you and suck the life out of you. The vine will be fine, but the bush will die. Many a time I've yanked up them vines and those bushes have lost a lot of leaves. And they look at all lopsided and everything because it's dying. Because these weeds and these vines have been overrun. So we're being given practical application. One thing you can do to help get your mind right is remove yourself from things and people that will lead you into sin. Mm -hmm. Don't be around prideful, hateful people. Remove yourself from them. If you're having a problem with the lust of the flesh and sexual wantonness, remove yourself from that attractive young woman or from that handsome young man. Remove yourself from that or people that encourage that type of behavior. Remove yourself. If you're dealing with masturbation and pornography, remove yourself from it. Don't be in the midst of it and think, oh, I'm strong enough to contain my... You got to remove yourself from it. If covetousness is your problem, you got to remove yourself from, from those different things that, you know, are an avenue for covetousness. Verse 11, one more time. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. These dark works will not bring forth any fruit. Get away from them. Let it go. But rather, reprove them. 
Reprove them inside of yourself. Deal with them. Rebuke them. Okay? Last scripture. Gail, I have you go to Matthew chapter 6, read verses 14 and 15, please. Okay. Matthew chapter 6, 14 and 15. For if ye forgive men their, their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So this is really dealing with the pride of life, that arrogancy, that haughtiness, that hatefulness within your heart towards your brother, towards your neighbor. This is something you got to deal with, that Cain-like spirit. Okay? If you want your sins to be forgiven of God, you got to forgive your brother when he offends you. You got to deal with that. We read in Sirach chapter 10, verse 6. Okay? Bear not hatred toward thy neighbor when he has done wrong. So your brother did something, he offended you. Sometimes, half of the times when our brother or our sister does something that offends us, it's something they didn't even know was offensive to us. A lot of times we don't even bring it to their attention. We just hold the grudge. And then we want to bear hatred on them and harm them with injurious acts or practices. We're not advised to do that. That is not the godly way. That's unfruitful works of darkness. Though there are people that are like that, that like to congregate together. If you got people like that in your life, separate from them. Those are people that are hateful, hold grudges, and they're going to die in their sins. But rather, when someone offends you, we're told by the words of Christ to go to your brother and deal with it. The pride of life. Pride of life. No, I ain't doing with that. I ain't doing with that nigga. I don't care. I'm not, I'm not. That's pridefulness. That's not the way of God. That's darkness. But you are called to be children of the light. Come out of darkness and go deal with it. Go deal with your brother. Cut off the pride. For the fear of God hates all evil. Okay? Read verse 15 one more time. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. So when it comes to your people, comes to your brother, because we're not talking about the heathen without. We're not talking about forgive Edom for all the evils he's done against us. That wouldn't make sense because the Heavenly Father said that he won't forget the evils that he's done against Israel. So that that's not even that's not even logical. That doesn't make any sense. What the what Christ is saying here is about concerning your brethren. When Peter asked, "Well, Master, how many times shall I forgive my brother?" What what two three times maybe three four times? He says seventy times seven. Peter like what? All right, now that's that seems a little excessive. Can I hate him for a little bit? He says seventy times seven. If your brother offend you that many times in a day, you forgive him, let it go. For real, forgive them and let it go. And this is why. Think how many times you offended the Heavenly Father with all your evil. Forgive your brother his trespasses. That is, if you want your trespasses forgiven. That's the pride of life. Pride of cross the arms and I ain't doing it. I ain't budging. But if you keep that dark, wicked, hateful spirit and you ain't going to get your sins forgiven and you're going to be destroyed. You're going to die in your sin. OK, so we have to learn to get our mind right, dealing with the lust of the flesh, lust of the eye and the pride of life. Shalom.